Okay, um, thanks very much for the invitation to come and talk. Um, I understand somebody dropped out, but whether they turned on and tuned in before they dropped out. I mean, I just get that one out of the way, you know, the sort of elephant in the room, you know. I'm a, a former chief constable. I spent 25 years in London. I spent five years in Cambridgeshire. In the last eight years, I've been advocating drug law reform and drug policy reform. I, uh, I studied philosophy and psychology at New College, Oxford, um, and then joined the Met. And in that time, I'm the, I was a guy who probably was interested in arresting people like you um, for possessing, using, perhaps supplying, even, and the law says, if you just give something to a mate, you're supplying. Um, and I realised pretty early on that this wasn't the way to approach what can be a problem with the consumption of certain substances. Um, what I'll do is, I think just briefly, because it may be reasonably interesting, just talk about some of the things I did as a, a cop, and also then talk more about why um, I think the law needs to change, and also a, a potential way of achieving it, which is, it's kind of slightly different from the way most people, I think, are thinking about trying to uh, persuade politicians to change the law. Uh, I've got, I think, 30 minutes. So we'll hope I can get through all of that because you made reference to the talk I gave at the University of Kent at Canterbury earlier on this year. There are actually two quite significant differences. One of which is that the talk then was much longer. Um, and I took questions as I was going along and I'd encourage you to do that. And the second thing is, you'll notice, I think it was back in March, my, my belly was out here, and I've been dieting, successfully. So we can all have... Thank you. Thank you. I was actually quite embarrassed, because it's on YouTube, you just, you know, Google it or whatever you do, and you'll find it. And I was standing there at one point, I was kind of like this, you know, and I think, my God, where, where did that come from? You know, so anyway, so that's pretty much resolved now. So... I remember, I remember as a young, a young cop, I worked in central London, and we had, um, sorry, the camera's trying to keep track of me, but I, I find it much better to walk about, and actually, frankly, I think it's better for people watching, because if you're just in one place, you kind of fixate, and then your eyes start to close, and you just nod off, and I always regard it as a tremendous challenge to make sure nobody actually does nod off. If you do, I'm quite happy to let you sleep, by the way. I'm not going to embarrass you. And the other thing in my, my rule about mobile phones is, I, well, I'm, I'm wasting my 30 minutes, but it's, uh, my rule about mobile phones is keep your mobile phones on, because when we hear your really embarrassing ringtone, you know, like ABBA or something, then we can all have a good laugh at your expense. So by all means, don't turn them off. So I remember working in central London, people used to start collapsing in the mid-70s. I started in 74. And um, they were brought into the Central Middlesex Hospital, which was on my patch. I was on the north side of Oxford Street, Old Marlebin Lane. It's been knocked down now. It's in Seymour Street. But what I realised then was you get these largely young people uh, being hauled in by the ambulance crew and nobody cared about them at all. Now, I'm not saying I'm the most sympathetic guy, but it did seem to me that these young people were clearly suffering. They were actually ill at that point because they'd taken something which was either an overdose or it was um, some adulteration. Uh, and they were thrown into a room called the pit. Uh, basically, mattresses um, into the recovery position, so if they did vomit, they wouldn't um, drown in their own vomit. And apart from very cursory care, they were basically left to kind of sleep it off. Now, even, you know, I was a young cop interested in a career, and I made it right to the top. I became a chief constable. So, you know, I, I wasn't there. On, on occasions in my career, I had to stop rocking the boat if I want to get, get promoted, you know. So that's, uh, that's another story. I'd got a blog, and I talked some... So, uh, there, um, uh, by the way, I'm at Tom C. Lloyd on Twitter, by the way. And I know you're all at Tom C. Lloyd, double L-O-Y-D. Um, and uh, look, I've got to move quickly. I, I, I started getting promoted. I was arresting my fair share of people. And I do remember as a chief inspector in Hampstead, there was a, a pub right on the heath. Name escapes me. Can anybody? Uh, anybody? Jack Straw's Castle. 
Thank you. Jack Straw's Castle is always one, which is great. It's a, I mean, it's a great pub with a lovely garden, wasn't it? Thanks. So somebody just tweeted me. Thanks very much. I just went beep. Um, uh, and at Jack Straw's um, Castle, there was some drug dealing going on, cannabis. And I, I, I organised a raid as a chief inspector. It's a pretty serious rank. You know, they go constable, sergeant, inspector, and the inspectors do the 24-hour shifts, and chief inspector basically gets out of shift work. Another, another good reason for getting promoted if you ever think about joining the police. <laughs> and I arrested, not physically, because I was in overall charge, I think it was about a dozen young black men. That's all we arrested. Now, that wasn't because we didn't arrest the white dealers. It's just that they were the dealers in that pub garden. And now I know much more about it, I realise there's a massively racist element to our current drug laws. And we now know that, and I now know that from the statistics. At the time, not surprisingly, if you know anything about Hampstead, I got a lot of stick from the local press and from local um, citizens, because they said, basically, you're being racist. And all I was doing was arresting the people who were doing the job of dealing. So it was neutral as far as I was concerned. But it was just interesting how that actually turned out to be racist. Um, and then later on, as a much more senior officer, I became aware of the huge resources. And by the way, this doesn't stop dealing. Uh, you appreciate that whenever a police officer arrests somebody, um, that creates a job opportunity for somebody else. I think this is pretty well known. Um, but it's true, it's not just hearsay, it's actually what happens because we see it. Because when I became a chief superintendent in charge of a place called Harrow Road Division um, in uh, the northwest bit of Westminster in London, uh, we organised a big uh, raid on street heroin, crack and anything else dealers on the Mozart estate. And it was a very successful operation. And a lot of police officers got a lot of overtime out of it. We arrested about 22, yeah, quite, thank you for the, the humorous acknowledgement of that. I mean, you know, a lot of people are driven by money. I think I'm getting expenses for coming here today, obviously not getting paid, but I must say that's very good of the organisers. Um, so at, at, that, at that place it was very successful because we arrested 22 people and we did it so well. I mean, the police get knocked and the police are actually very good at doing some of this stuff. It's just that Picking off the old drug dealer here and there just simply is not going to impact the market. The market is what? $500 billion annually in the world. Spend by law enforcement maybe $100 billion. I speak in dollars because we have to speak in the language of America, who are pretty much responsible for all of this. Nixon back in 1971 declaring the war on drugs. And let me just have a quick moment to reflect on what the war of dr on drugs is and isn't. You can't have a war on drugs. It's like having a war on a table. I mean, the drugs are inanimate objects. What we've got is a war on people. And I'll go into some of the aspects of that. And I realised this as I was uh, you know, taking part in enforcing prohibition uh, in the UK. It's a war on people, and that becomes increasingly clear the more you realise, just, and you, know, you haven't got to get a degree from Oxford to work this out, the more you realise that not only is it not working in terms of reducing the amount of tables or drugs that there are in the world, it's actually gone the other way. There's a huge amount of damage being done to people. And I reflect on it. I mean, I don't, in a sense, feel guilty about it because I had a job to do. And arguably, arguably, the fact that I'm now, as a former chief constable, talking about it means that there's a way that the message can be received by whoever's listening, including politicians, including the media, uh, anybody, including senior police officers and politicians in Latin America, where I've had the opportunity to run courses, etc. That maybe it probably was worth it, but anyway, it's history, so I can't undo it, and there's no point, as they say, crying over spilt milk. So the Mozart estate was an example of where we did a huge amount of excellent work. All the people came in were arrested, we simply showed them a video of the buys, there's your dossier, they all pleaded guilty because the police work was terrific. A waste of time, was it um, uh, in the mayoral um, 
campaign just recently, the London mayoral campaign. Um, uh, cannabis is a way, uh, what was it? Oh, I can't, I don't know why, I shouldn't have mentioned it, I didn't know what the punchline was, it's pathetic. Um, <laughs> but it was basically um, Brian Paddock saying, oh, cannabis is a waste of police, is a waste of police time or something? I'm looking at you, Daryl, because you, you're a lawyer, you know this stuff. And, and anyway, anyway, I mean, the point is, it is a complete waste of time. And then I realised, as a much more senior officer, I was, um, I was responsible for authorising very intrusive surveillance not prison stuff, but we are talking here about um, getting into people's lives because we suspected them of drug dealing and then arresting them and sending them to prison often for a very long time. When I say often, I don't mean we arrested that many, but when we did arrest them, they were often spent, sent to prison for a very long time. I studied philosophy at Oxford. It leaves you with this scarred view of accuracy and pedantry. Um, they used to say things like, what do you mean by what do you mean? And I thought, well, I've signed up for this course. But in some ways, it's helpful to be quite reflective about what you're saying. So anyway, I came to this conclusion that this war on people, as I prefer to call it, this war on people was and is a hugely costly, counterproductive, harmful failure. Now, I don't suppose there are many people here who would actually uh, disagree with me on that. But um, my, my take on it is... And, and I suppose it probably is just worth running through um, a bit of this, a bit of the reasons why I think that. And part of it is the money that's being spent by police all over the world, law enforcement, courts, prisons, the whole system, including, for that matter, treatment, um, is, and, I mean, I'm not against treatment, but prohibition makes the opportunities to need treatment far more likely because all drugs are more dangerous when their production and supply is in the hands of criminals who only care about the money they're going to make. So it's incredibly costly for police. In the US, for example, the detection rates for things like murder and other serious offences have dropped as the huge incarceration of drug users and dealers has gone up. 5% of the world's population 25% of the world's prisoners. It's an absolute outrage. Um, because there's an, a lost opportunity cost. Every time a police officer is looking at, to arrest somebody for drug possession or drug dealing, and as I said, sometimes that drug dealing is very low level, then they're not doing something else, which I suspect the vast majority of citizens would actually want them to do. Clearly there are social costs, um, and there is a cost to the legitimacy, legitimacy of policing. Because if you've got, say, three million cannabis users in this country, and you've got a shed load more who are taking other substances, and I mean, I can't believe that the government is saying that drug consumption is going down in this country. It may be going down in certain areas where, for example, it's no longer fashionable to inject heroin into your veins, or wherever you can get it. Um, but it's clearly not the case that drug consumption is going down. Whether you, whether you limit it to so-called controlled drugs, of course, they're only controlled by criminals. This is why I've got to pack everything in in 30 minutes, so I hope I, um, hope I don't sound too garbled, um, is that it's, it's completely outrageous, and it's, it's completely illegitimate now for the Home Secretary, every time there's a call for some sort of review to say up. Drug problem is effectively under control, is reducing, and the worst thing of all, the worst lie, is we have to keep prohibition in place to save our children. I mean, it's just... You see, I don't believe that these politicians are actually stupid. I believe they are actually, in a sense, in the way I felt under pressure to conform. I'm leaping ahead slightly, so hold that thought, because I'll come on to politicians and polling to kind of finish things off. But it's that kind of sense of loss of legitimacy, which is hugely damaging. For the police as an institution, what the hell are you doing with a sniffer dog at King's Cross Station? What the hell are you doing as a, with a sniffer dog or two and a van, and you're going around pubs? I think the latest one I saw on these various... Tunbridge Wells. It was a great success. You know, we, we caution somebody for cannabis. I mean, 
You know how much money those dogs cost? Not in kind of the cost, but it's the fee, it's the training. And then, of course, attached to every dog is a handler, and they're really expensive. Police officers, 45, 50 grand a year, all told. Oh, this very, very cheap testing they want to bring in now with these little swaps for cannabis. Well, well the thing is that the thing, the thing is that, that with all of this, it's all part of the. Now, I'm going to have to be very careful not to be racist here, but I'll, I'll talk in reported speech about when I was a child, if you went to Ireland and you asked somebody directions to a place, the Irishman would say to you, well, if I was you, I wouldn't start from here. So, moving quickly on, um, the point about my, that's an answer to you, which is that when you've got prohibition in place, the whole world goes mad. And everybody comes up with fantastic ideas for doing all of the things which fit into the, as it were, through the prism of prohibition. But when you stop and look at it, I mean, this thing about testing for cannabis for driving, I'm very worried about the fact that lots of people who are not impaired for driving will actually end up not only with the kind of the driving ban, but some sort of extra stigma, which is very concerning. But of course it falls logically out of prohibition. Can, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, do. And uh, if I'm allowed to go over, th uh, who's talking after me? Well, I'm chairing the next thing at five, but there's a half hour break, so you can... I'll just keep on going. You can all bugger off. I've got so much to talk about. You know, that, so, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm here now. I drove down, actually I drove down with my daughter from Cambridge. It's very convenient because we're swapping cars. She's got a nice new A3, and I've got a little, a little scratchy little Peugeot 206, which has actually got a dent on it now. So that's what I'm driving back in. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So I'm happy to stay here, you know, make the journey worthwhile. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist. Yeah. And, uh, I work for substance disease and I work with children, and I'm very much wedded to the medical evidence that we have to live and my, all my work is based around evidence-based. When, when we can show data for things, and we have evidence, we have evidence-based, there's every, using, every reason to use it. So I've followed David Nutt's work there closely with this rational um, list of drugs, looking at the rational risks and benefits of drugs, ranking them in order, and trying to put that onto the desk of the government. When it's so frustrating that we don't have evidence-based politics, we have evidence-based medicine, I, I'm not sure if we have evidence-based policing, but the whole drugs question is it doesn't work on evidence-based, and this is what's so frustrating with scientists. If I can put a portfolio on the desk of the government with the data about the real rational risks and benefits of drugs, and then they can just disregard it and say, we know that's the truth, we're not arguing with these scientists, you're absolutely right, but we're just not going to do it. I, I, yeah, well, I, I, I once did some work with a human rights lawyer um, in London to try and work out whether or not you could take the, the government to court for not, for example, increasing the prescribing of heroin to heroin users, because that is probably more helpful yeah. under certain circumstances for quite a few people. And the, the, the law effectively says, ultimately, these things are a matter of judgment. It's immensely frustrating, but I think I'll come to answer that in a way a little, just a little wander around my philosophical past, which is that you could so argue that evidence-based policy making will restrict you to what's known, and it won't enable you to take that imaginative leap into the future. But maybe policy doesn't work that way. Your basic point I take, it's incredibly frustrating. And it's very frustrating, and a psychologist actually, I was, I was at a conference in Cambridge uh, fairly recently, she said that she thinks it's because drugs are about things getting inside your body. And so we have a real kind of deep-seated concern about that in the way that education policy, even what, well, health policy, transport policy, you can make changes which make things a little better. Whereas in drug policy reform, it seems as though what you've got to do is make, propose something perfect. And you can't even have a debate about it because there's this, what I call a kind of quasi-religious church of drug prohibition. Imagine going to the equivalent of, which is presumably the President of the United States, but imagine going to the Pope instead and going to the Pope and say, Pope, I just want to discuss something with you. He says, what's that, my son? He, and I say, well, I want to discuss with you the possibility that God doesn't exist. You're not going to get very far, are you? And that's the problem with some of the 
key people in this quasi-religious church that we've got at the moment, you can't really talk about anything which isn't prohibition, because that's just what they believe in. So, um, I, if I don't answer questions, it's because I bond off somewhere else. But, I mean, I hope to come back to politicians and polls before I finish. And, but, yeah, do interrupt, do engage. I think it's always much, much better that way. OK, let's come back to the young kids. OK, I mean, I know it's blindingly obvious, but it's quite clear that if you set up a system where substances that people want, why do people want drugs? Makes them feel good. It's pretty simple. Lots of other reasons. Spiritual awareness staying up all night to do that and essay that you hadn't done on time, finish the dissertation, uh, enhance sporting prowess, listen to music, just relax, turn off the demons in your head, whatever it is, lots of reasons for taking drugs, and almost all of them good in their own way. I've already said that if you get the drugs from the criminals, of course, that's the problem. So if you stop people doing that, it's quite clear that another market turns up, and so the criminals take over, and they corrupt the police, uh, you, you know, I haven't got to go through all the horrors that are down to this. All the incredible, and I must say, if you do travel, I mean, we've got problems in this country. You've got, if, you, if you open your eyes, you can see the real problems that are caused to uh, drug users in this country. Not all, of course, because for many, your drug use is not a problem uh, other than the criminality. But when you've actually gone down that spiral, when... Uh, just think, at the age of 10, this kid says, you know, my ambition in life when I'm 25 is to be a crack and heroin addicted whore. Now, not many people say that, but they get there. And then they are ostracised. And people hate them because they're smelly and dirty and they'll steal off their grandmothers. Well, they will, but you've got to look underneath. Frankly, I think a lot of police do that, you know, because one thing the police do do is get in amongst that. Many citizens don't see that. But what I'm saying is, if you travel the world, you get a kind of incredible, you get this imba imbalance in, in poverty, you have no social services, and you really do have incredible damage caused to millions of people. And I'm not here talking about the executions and the imprisonment, which is bad enough, just simply the fact that people are just kind of left. There is simply, they just fall out completely of the system. And because of this sort of quasi, I mean, I haven't got a lot of time for religion, as you might have imagined, but... Um, I mean, I'm not quite the Dawkins uh, man. I, I, do, I mean, he's a really bright Oxford professor, and all I did was just slink through my degree. But um, I do think that it's, it's this kind of unwillingness to waver. Bernard Levin, you may remember him, some of you, was a brilliant columnist for the Times. And he wrote a 500-word article once in one sentence. It was absolutely brilliant. And he talked about the single-issue fanatic. Very, very dangerous people. They will bomb you because you haven't fed your cat well enough. Sorry, there may be animal rights activists in this room, and we did have our fair share in Cambridgeshire. Anyway, I must, I must move on. So, the youngsters, okay, they're, criminals are incentivised because we give them this profitable market to sell to kids. It's quite obvious. Everybody knows that. The polling of MPs that was done, I think it was done earlier this year, or maybe a little bit last year. Feel, feel free to correct me if, um, if I've got that slightly wrong. 75% of 150 MPs in the House of Parliament said, we don't think the drug laws are working. They know there's a big problem. Theresa May, on the 6th of September, towards the Home Affairs Select Committee, where they call her periodically to um, give evidence, said, I quote almost verbatim, because I was so, well, I wasn't astonished, but she said, no, I don't know of, and nor can I find any evidence that criminalising drug use is beneficial. But I believe it is. <laughs> Evidence-based. So that's, that is what we're dealing with. Now, uh, why is it harmful? Death, disease, addiction, all drugs more dangerous, criminalisation, ostracism, um, everything gets worse. And pretty much those who really have major problems with substance abuse, because obviously I include alcohol with this, because alcohol is a major contributor and substance used by people who have problems, you often look back in people's history of, of, of sexual, physical or emotional abuse. And it's, it's, it's kind of quite frightening how often that crops up with, with people who are unlucky enough to have experienced that are self-medicating, and there's certainly a lot of evidence which says that there is a motivation for drug-taking. I dare say, 
I haven't studied all of your, um, you know, all the talks you've had here, but I dare say there's a lot of talk about that as well in this sort of conference. And it's quite clear that if you've got a problem with your substance abuse, the last thing you need is some cop to come along and arrest you and throw you in jail. That's if you haven't got a problem. If you have got a problem, the last thing you need is a cop to come along and arrest you and throw you into jail. So, whichever way you look at this, whichever way you say it, it just doesn't make logical sense. Now, I'm going to, um, uh, I mean, obviously I'd be very happy to take questions, etc., but I'm probably now respecting the chair of the group and also remembering the hopeful words from the chair of the next group, um, that two major points, one of which is about the drugs being a business. I've, I've hinted at that already. The fact is, there's a demand so there's an illicit supply. Now, I'm sure there are entrepreneurial businessmen in this room. I'm not. I, I was a, a sort of a company man, if you like. Um, but I do understand the basics of business, which is that you've got to have more money coming in, if you like, uh, than is, is going out. You've got to have more profit than loss. You've got to have more profit than risk. You see, by and large, in most businesses, your risk are your finances, your costs. For a criminal, their risks are execution, that doesn't seem to work, imprisonment, all the criminal sanctions. So we pretty much tried our hand on that side, on the risks, on the cost side of the business, so we're now talking on the profit side. And it's quite simple. Governments take over the control and regulation of these products. Won't be perfect, that's the policy problem, won't be perfect, but it'd be a shed load better. And that's the answer. That is actually how you tackle it from a business level. And anybody who reads any economist, pretty much all of them, will say exactly the same. I think Friedman is a great champion of that. I'm sorry, sorry, I was just looking over here for a bit. Daryl in a moment, yeah. Do you think that um, something like the New Zealand psychoactive spill, where there's a regulated market for synthetic products, is something that could be done in the UK? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good start, but it's really... It's a good idea to say to people, we're not going to kind of criminalise you for the products, but we're going to make sure that they are controlled and regulated up to health standards. That's got to be what we've got to aim at. Whether the New Zealand experience will get you there in the short term. But interesting enough, a few years ago, I was actually in India, and I met three of the people who were working behind the scenes. They were in the New Zealand... I can't remember their names now. Uh, the new, and they were working up a new policy, and I'll tell you what, this will gladden your heart, because what they were told to do as lawyers, we don't want our current law to drive our policy, we want our policy to shape our law. I think this is the result, isn't it? Controlled and regulated supply of drugs has got to be the way forward. It was Daryl here, then a gentleman there. Isn't their position, even if it's subconscious, that to do that, even though there would be less harm and less cost, would be to condone the practice and therefore they're sending the message. So it, aren't they prepared to sell us all out to make a, a moral judgment? Well, it's, it's definitely in the, it's that moral quasi-religious sphere that we're operating in, unfortunately, where logic, reason, evidence doesn't really count. I mean, apparently we do have people who believe that supernatural things happen. I dare say there's some in this room. And from the evidence of walking from the lift to here, I think there's probably, probably quite a lot of that. But, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with kind of spiritual fulfilment, but there are certainly some pretty weird beliefs in mainstream religions. And I think that it seems, I think that in part, and I haven't really thought about this deeply, but I think that probably legitimizes you to have weird beliefs. One of the weird beliefs is that, that drug consumption overall will go up. Remember, there's an incentive under the current system. And when you look across, and released did this report, they looked at 20 countries, Portugal is the one that's always rolled out. Um, they, uh, drug consumption had not gone up. There was a bit of a surge, well, not surge, it was an increase a few years ago. But now we're back for, recent, for past month use in Portugal, comfortably below 2002 levels. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that they just think they can get away with it because morally, remember, the mantra is drugs are bad, lock people up. The challenge is, give me the opposite of that. And it's very difficult to articulate. Sir? How do you suggest we get over this belief then? And you use an example of... This is a planted question because that's what I'm coming on to next. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You use an example of talking to the Pope about there not being a God. So if we assume that if we can be saying that we can't 
can't talk to the politicians because they won't listen to us. How are we supposed to implement any real change? You'll be really glad that I came today. I used to say this to my bosses, and it used, I'd say, they'd say, we've got a tricky problem. I said, don't worry, boss, I'll solve that for you. And it worked. I got promoted. And I did occasionally solve the problem as well, because you appreciate people have a very short memory span. I don't just mean police. Although I must tell you a, a brief joke, which is that there's a... Some people think police are stupid. I think it's a bit unfair. But this police officer was standing behind the desk of the police station, and a penguin walked in, looking extremely sad, unhappy. The penguin walks in, the police officer, solicitors, notebook, pen, says, you know, how can I help? Is there a problem? It looks as though you're a bit upset. And the penguin says, I've lost my brother. Oh, and the police officer says, oh, really? Yeah, well, what does he look like? Penguin. They all look... Oh, never mind. <laughs> it, it, I tried that on a South American audience. It worked quite well, actually. But anyway, OK, so let's, let's just let's wrap up then, OK? Um, Politicians and polling. Okay, we know that there are very powerful, pretty much undeniable arguments from the evidence that we'd be better off with a controlled and regulated system. I don't advocate a, 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 a free-for-all um, because I think there really are some dangers and certainly you've got to think about vulnerable people and young people who aren't necessarily capable of making decisions uh, until they reach an age of majority to be determined. Okay, so... Control and regulation, not free-for-all legalisation. Don't argue that. I think that what we need to do, and I'm talking to some people about this because I think there's potential for creating an organisation that focuses on this. You don't advocate drug law reform on the basis of the evidence. What you do is you put the evidence of what voters opinions would be about politicians who will introduce the debate. Now, some are already brave enough to do that. Julian Huppert is the Liberal Democrat MP for um, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge City. Um, Nick Clegg probably thinks he'll lose his, uh, his seat in Sheffield. So he supported the Home Affairs Select Committee, which argued for a Royal Commission. At the moment, we don't even have a debate going, because politicians think as soon as they start the debate, they'll go soft on drugs. People get their information from the media. How else would you do it? I get my information about education, well, actually from my wife, who's a teacher, but, you know, she's biased. And I don't believe everything she says, I mean, you know, but she's got a point of view. Point is, uh, media um, give you your information, and the media gives false information about drugs. If we actually did the proper research amongst the voting pop, if you don't vote, I'm not going to come and talk to you unless you say I'm going to vote. So I can go to politicians and say, this is the hard polling data. Not, do you want to legalise drugs? Yes or no. But would you still vote for your politician if they started saying, let's talk about drug law reform? I'll come in a moment. I just want to finish this point. Um, would you actually vote more for a candidate who is going to not say, let's get up and legalise drugs, but let's have the debate? I think that's the way in. Because if you simply go on the facts, we've got moral majority wins, we have got a government that uh, does, is not evidence-based, we've got a kind of quasi-religious sort of the Pope won't discuss the lack of God. We've got all of these barriers. These, and all the other thing is all about bodies and it saves the children. All this, it's all messed up. The politicians get it, but they don't speak. Let's legitimise them speaking. I think it was you first and then, then here. And One of the most disenfranchised groups in society and young people. Mm. It, look, if I c one of the things I would want to do is I would want to get the young to say on this issue, now not all, because some are still, on this issue, if once you're 18, and there's an awful lot of 16-year-olds, now hang on, they you've got to be 16 by May the 5th probably this year, then you're going to be 18, then you can vote. And if you start saying things like, we will vote, if, we're not asking to, for us to go crazy and have free, all of this stuff, but let's have a debate. That's the power, potentially, if they vote. I think our main demographic is probably um, people like me. I'm 61. I vote. I've got nothing else to do. I'm retired. I look forward to those Thursdays. 
and I could walk down with my dog to the polling station. Well, I limped slightly, I got a bad knee. So I limped down to the polling station, and all around me are the grey head, the lame, the limp, push, you know. And yet, where are the young people? They're out having a good time. If you really want to have a good time as a young person, vote for change in the drug laws. Yeah. Um, two points then. Um, that was said to a lot of young people about education and university fees, so they all voted to live down and then that didn't happen. So one, we saw where they've been saying that, but when we actually vote, will it happen? Two, I completely agree with your point that we have to start with the general public and their opinions. Um, because yes, we know the politicians know, they're educated people, of course they know the evidence. Um, so politicians are basing their policies, it seems, on electoral anxieties. So therefore that tells me that the public are misinformed. So you can say, well, will you vote for that politician if you talked about drug reform? And they might go, well, no, because drugs are really dangerous, drugs are bad. If the public aren't educated, then of course they're not going to No, vote. and so what, so what I want to do is, um, what I want, I appreciate the point about the kind of lack of, oh, do you want to? So, so it's, the, it's Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, and it's Rupert Murdoch that needs to, that needs to change and needs yeah. to start realising how dangerous prohibition is. Well, yes, but the thing is, I don't think they will. And therefore, I think we have to do it through a different way. And that is actually appealing directly. I think that there are significant swathes of voters who... And, and, and this will involve a momentum, and I'm talking to one journalist in particular, but others, who I think will run along with this. The Times will... Camilla Cavendish in The Times has basically, I think, written Transform's brief for them. You know, it, and The Telegraph, although they do make some amazing errors, which they withdrew that one recently. Um, that still doesn't get around the issue that if the public are misinformed, mm. saying a lot of people get their information from the media, and they're still printing misinformation. I, I, want, to, I want to start rolling this ball by, by talking to maybe Rotary Clubs, mm. by talking to the people who will vote. Because what I've found, and I do... I always offer myself to speak to people. I'm always very happy to do it because I want to, I want to persuade people. I'll come in just a moment. I want to persuade people of my point of view because I think I'm right. But what I want to do now is subtly shift the ground. I do want people to listen to the sort of thing I've been talking about. And by and large, they all go, yeah, you've got a good point. But what about the Daily Mail? And I say, look, do you vote? That's what I want to say. I want to say, do you vote? If you vote, make it clear that you're happy to vote for a politician who will simply follow the Home Affairs Select Committee recommendation. It's you and then, uh, I think, up the back there, but it's here first. I mean, it's not, it's not easy, a lot of work, a lot of groundwork, but get the momentum rolling. I think it could be interesting enough, sorry, for the media, and you know what they say, I, I, this is the conch shell, sorry. Um, <laughs> although don't behave like the Lord of the Flies, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> if I lose the conch shell, I've had it, you know. Um, <laughs> Um, I, th we, I think we could start something rolling because the secret of this is also to be getting, getting the right sort of media in place. Now, I, and, uh, the Sun, July last year, published a poll. Tom Newton Dunn was, the, Dunn was the journalist. I got a big piece in the Mirror in January this year. What's his guy? Tom Daly, I think, was the journalist. Basically, reflecting the polls, which are already showing. Something like two-thirds of the, of the people polled, the population, and you might want to go refine it to voters, are saying, let's at least try Portugal. Let's give it a go. So we're already quite far into the process. This is why I'm reasonably optimistic, and I feel at the time, you know, I've got to do a lot of work. I've got to go around and do a lot of gigs. But, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm, I love it. You know, it's great. And it's really fantastic, because I don't think anybody's fallen asleep, which is a real result.